for as long as little Anne could remember. She had always wanted a dog, not a toy dog, no toy dogs of all sizes and colors that her relatives bought her endlessly. She wanted a real live dog. She dreamed of how the little shaggy lump would become her most loyal friend, how she would walk and play with him, take care of him. But that dream never came true. Mom, Dad and Anne lived for a long time in a tiny one-room apartment where a dog was out of the question because of the cramped space. Finally, when Anne was four, her parents got a bigger apartment with two rooms and a large hallway. Anne was the most excited of all. At last her dream would come true. She would have a dog that would live with her in one of the rooms of their apartment. Anne, sunshine, let's wait with the dog, honey, mom said. You see, we're going to have another baby soon. The girl is your little sister. Anne listened and realized bitterly that she wasn't going to have a dog. At least not in the near future. Six months later, Pam, Anne's little sister, came into their family. A few days after Mom came home from the hospital with Pam, they had a small party at their house. Grandma, an aunt, Mom's sister and her husband, and a couple of very close friends of Dad's came over. After the adults had sat and drank to the health of the little girl and her mother, Uncle Nicholas asked the frowning Anne in the nasty, husky voice that some adults find it necessary to speak to children. Anne, are you very glad you have a little sister now? No, Anne said clearly and loudly. Not at all. There was silence in the room. The adults were clearly confused and didn't know what to say. Why? Uncle Nicholas asked rashly. Because I wanted a dog, not a sister. Four-year-old Anne answered honestly and frankly. The adults moved and coughed in embarrassment. Some tried to laugh to turn it into a joke. Anne didn't ruin the party, but she didn't make it any better. After the guests left, her mother criticized Anne for her words and shamed her for her bad attitude toward her little sister, and Anne sincerely could not understand what she was guilty of. She had told the truth. She didn't need her little sister, but she did need a dog. Pam grew up happy, healthy, and boisterous. Her parents adored her, and Anne often thought they didn't really need her now. But childish resentment was commonplace jealousy. In such a situation, Anne made her secret. Pam needed an eye on her. And as Anne grew older, she began to help her mother with Pam. She learned to dress and feed her sister. She walked and played with her. She sat with Pam when Mommy had to go out for a little while. All in all, everything seemed to be going well. But Mom noticed with some concern that Anne had not developed any special love for her little sister. It was as if Anne was fulfilling a responsible family duty. The girl's mom, Kate, shared her concerns with her husband. Oh, come on, Kate. Don't get all worked up and everything is normal. They're just still little, both of them. And Anne is too little to understand what a baby sister is. You think so? Did Kate look at her husband with doubt? Of course, she's not interested in Pam yet. Well, what's so interesting? She's lying down. So she's screaming. So she's walking. It's a big deal. So not a person yet, but a billet. Her husband laughed, looking tenderly at Kate. And Anne is a serious lady. Now Pam will talk. Anne will change at once. You'll see. Oh, Jack, I wish it could come true the way you say. Let's do it in a year. When Pam's older, we'll get Anne a dog, huh? We'll see. I don't think Anne's gonna have time for a dog anytime soon. Kate's husband ended the conversation. The girls grew, changed, and in general, not much different from millions of other sisters. They quarreled, made up, quarreled again, and again made up, argued, played and everything seemed to be normal. The first signal that things between the sisters were not as easy as they seemed came when Anne was ten and Pam was six. Anne was walking Pam home from kindergarten. The way home passed through the schoolyard and the stadium, where Anne saw a group of classmates. The girls talked as if they hadn't been apart since three hours ago. It was about twenty minutes later when Anne saw Pam missing running around the stadium looking for her obnoxious little sister. Anne suddenly heard a quiet. Anne, I'm here. Pam's voice came from downstairs. Anne looked around in fright 
and realized the sound was coming from the hole that was supposed to signify a foxhole in civil defense class. Pan was sitting in the corner of the trench. What are you sitting there for? Come out quickly. Anne waved her hand impatiently. I can't for some reason, said Pan, and squirmed. Anne struggled to get Pam out of the trench and dragged her home by the hand. As she walked, she wondered who was going to get the worst of it from Mommy tonight. For the dirty jacket, her sister or her, when she got home and felt entitled to be angry with Pam, Anne said to her, Now sit in your room and wait for your parents. You'll have to explain yourself to them. Pam sobbed strangely. She was unusually quiet and silent. However, Anne, who had just arranged a meeting with her friends, was not up to her whims. After half an hour Anne ran out into the street and did not return until evening. Such faces on her parents' faces Anne had never seen before. Silently letting Anne into the apartment, her mother went into the kitchen without saying a word. Anne, frightened by her mother's behavior, quickly undressed and followed her. The parents were sitting at the table with Pam sitting between them with her arm in a cast. It turned out that when the little girl had fallen down the hole, she had broken her arm. Anne looked at Pam in horror. For the first few minutes she didn't know what to say. And there was a heavy silence in the kitchen, which was finally broken by her mother. Why don't you tell me how it happened? Mom's voice sounded calm, but it felt like she was holding on with all her might. Mom, she just fell, that's all. I didn't know. She didn't tell me anything. How could I have known? Anne babbled. Why didn't she say anything to me? Pam, why? Why didn't you tell me you were hurt? Anne was almost screaming. Why didn't you? Exactly. Why all of a sudden did Daddy say that? Here you go and think why. Anne lay face down on her bed and cried, feeling deeply hurt and offended. Why was she blamed for everything? Was she the one who had pushed Pam into the pit? And was it her fault that Chatterbox Pam had somehow not said anything to her this very time? And would she have made Pam suffer in pain until her parents came? If she knew she was in trouble. So why was everyone jumping on her? The door to the room she and Pam shared shrieked open. Pam stood on the threshold, her face tear-stained with sunken eyes. And... I'm sorry I didn't say anything to you. I'll never do it again. I'll be sure to tell you right away when I fall again. There won't be a next time. Don't fall again. Anne said all this into the pillow and generally come here. They sat together on the bed for a long time, pressed tightly against each other, perhaps for the first time in their lives. And Mom was in the kitchen quietly crying into Dad's shoulder. It was a terrible incident that, strangely enough, brought the sisters closer together. Anne was more sensitive. And Pam was smarter than their parents thought. The older sister became more attentive to the baby, and the younger sister reached out to Anne in a childlike way, sensing that attention. For several years after that, they had an almost perfect duo, complimenting each other. Anne taught Pam to take things seriously, helped her do her homework, and Pam amused Anne was her home theater and circus, as Daddy used to say. Except that Anne never got the dog she wanted because of Pam's severe allergy to hair. Her grandmother, who lived in another town and saw her family not as often as everyone would have liked. On one visit, she called the girls over to her. With a mysterious smile, she pulled a small velvet box out of her pocket. Fourteen-year-old Sirius beyond her years, Anne and Pam, who had turned ten the day before. They came over and sat down next to Grandma. Girls, my darlings, I have a present for you. You have become real sisters. You should always remember that relatives are not just those who were born in the same family. Siblings are when one hurts and the other feels the pain. Be together and love each other. And to always remember that each of you has a sister. I give you this. Grandma opened a red box. Two perfectly identical gold pendants were fixed on white silk. On the thin ovals lay dainty, very thin roses, and along the edge of the pendants ran a scarcely perceptible garland of color. How lovely! Pam squealed enthusiastically. Anne smiled demurely and gratefully. 
Wear it, my darlings, and remember that there is no one in the world closer and more dear to you. There are only two such pendants on earth, one for each of you. Cherish them, but most importantly, cherish your feelings for each other. Grandma's gift kept the girls' imaginations busy for a long time. At least Pam did. She wore the pendant without taking it off. She showed it off to everyone, and was sure to tell them what it was for. Then, invariably, Anne would be asked to show her pendant and asked to compare the two pieces of jewelry. The girls were very different, and at the same time remarkably alike. They were really very much alike in appearance. So much so that from a distance they were often mistaken for twins, especially after Pam had quickly caught up with her sister in height. But up close, the difference between them was obvious. Anne was certainly a very pretty girl, but her features were as if muted, a little erased, covered with an invisible veil. Pam, on the other hand, unlike Anne, was all bright catchy memorable. Anne's light brown eyes were just brown to everyone. And Pam's eyes, which were exactly the same color as her sister's, seemed to glow a dark January. Her older sister's hair lay thick on her shoulders, but some dull strands in the younger one seemed lush and lively. Even the Kanapushki, protruding on their noses in the spring on the first sunshine, behaved differently. Anne's were as if they were clumped together and seemed just a dark spot on the girl's face. Pam had them spreading cheerfully across her face, making it look unusually cute. It was as if Pam were sharing her joy with herself, with the whole world. Whereas Anne, on the contrary, hid everything, hid it from people. Pam was impulsively determined and impatient in everything she did without a second thought. She took up new endeavors and hobbies, and also without too much thought, and without regret, abandoned them. As soon as things cooled down, during her time at school, she managed to play in the humor team, and the rock band of the school, painting, ballroom dancing, volleyball, and God knows what else. Anne, on the other hand, was not childishly persistent and stubborn in pursuing her goals. At the age of eight, she went to music school, and after a couple of years she realized that she was not interested in playing the piano but no one ever found out about it. Year after year, Anne went to the hated piano and graduated from music school, naturally without much brilliance. Anne's playing wasn't particularly talented, but she was diligent. After that, almost no one but her mother heard her. Pam, meanwhile, in a few months learned to play the guitar quite dashingly and without learning the wisdom of solfeggio, invariably became the star of any party. At school, Anne clung to every grade as hard as she could, trying to be the best in every subject, and she was devastated when she failed. Pam moved from class to class with brilliant results in the subjects she was interested in and no worries about the subjects she, he said she didn't care about. That's how different they were. Of course, the years had made them smarter. The realization came that they were two of the closest people on earth to each other. They learned to respect each other, to recognize their mistakes and other people's truth. In general, to live as real sisters should. But whether in their relationship was a real sincere love for each other, did not know even their kind, wise, wonderful mother. Of course, Pam, such as she was, could not fail to be a success with the male population. The rare attention given by the boys, to the quite pretty Anne, was no comparison with Pam's popularity. The first very sensitive, though involuntary click from her sister, Anne received in the third year of the institute. The guys in her group were merrily celebrating the midpoint of the student median. Much to Anne's surprise, her parents allowed her to host this somewhat risque event at their apartment. It was all very cool, especially the fact that David the guy in their group, who Anne really liked, was almost never leaving her side and had already said tons of compliments to her. By eleven o'clock in the evening the guys had gotten a little tipsy and daring at the same time. Anne suddenly felt David's arm around her waist with trepidation. Apparently, David was not going to limit himself to that. Anne waited with an agonizing yet joyful anxiety to see what would happen next and what she should do. There was nothing to do. 
The front door slammed and Pam burst into the room, shaking the snow from her hair. Not at all embarrassed by the fact that the apartment was packed with strangers older than she was, she got to know everyone in a few minutes, woke up the dozing, made the sad ones laugh, and she brought them along with her. A sense of excitement, freshness, and fun. The student party, which had almost faded thanks to Pam's 10th grade class, was boiling over with renewed vigor. But Anne didn't notice all that. Only one thing was important to her. David was no longer hugging her around the waist or looking at her at all, but was staring at Pam in amazement. At that, Anne bitterly and honestly admitted to herself that Pam hadn't done anything on purpose. She had nothing to reproach her sister for, except that in Pam's presence Anne herself seemed to dissolve, to become invisible and uninteresting. The next day, Anne sobbed in her mother's lap, and a frightened Pam stood by her side. Mommy, I hate her. Anne screamed through her tears. She ruined my whole life. She stole David away from me. I don't want a sister like that. Quickly unbuttoning her shirt collar, Anne hooked a thin chain with her fingers and snatched her grandmother's pendant from her neck. Tossing it at Pam's feet, Anne became truly hysterical. Completely stunned at such accusations, and especially that her sister had done such a thing, to their sister's pendant. Pam stoically met her mom's gaze. Mom, I have no idea what this is about. I don't know any David. Pam was near tears herself. Of course, when everyone had calmed down and sorted out the situation, Anne regretted her words and action. An apology was made. The chain was fixed, but there was still a lingering grudge on Anne's heart. When Anne graduated, 19-year-old Pam was still wondering what she should do. But to her credit, she didn't sit on her parents' neck. She had no complexes about it, typical for a girl from an intelligent family. She worked as a cashier in a fast-food restaurant. For some reason, she learned to sing to the amazement of her parents and had fun with her numerous friends. Mom occasionally shook her head, but there was nothing to reproach Pam with. The youngest daughter simply lived in the world for her own pleasure. And in some ways, Kate even secretly invite her. Six months later, however, Pam's easygoing attitude to life had gone a little too far. Mom, Dad, I'm getting married. Pam said simply and mundanely, sitting at the family dinner table, shoveling a piece of pie with gusto. Kate slowly and carefully put her fork on the table and for some reason looked not at the source of the sensational statement, but at her husband, to whom, calmly and ironically asked the father of the family, to the boy, Pan was clearly having a good time. And thank you for that. The father joined in the fun. Are you crazy? Kate's nerves finally gave out. Is this some kind of joke to you? You think this is funny? Mom, he's a great guy. We've known each other for six months, and we love each other. Pam stumbled on that last part. Pam, are you pregnant? Kate voiced her parents' biggest fear in Kate's eyes. It was the only reasonable explanation for a 19-year-old girl suddenly getting married. No, come on, Mom. That's ridiculous. Why would she be pregnant? We just want to be together. Don't worry, we won't bother you. William got the apartment from his grandmother. He's a rich heir. That's where we'll live. He works too, so we'll have money to live on. Anyway, my dear parents, everything is simple and good. Pam said serious phrases, questions she answered without waiting to be asked. They were very complicated, but somehow in Pam's mouth they quickly lost their complexity and gravity, and everything really began to seem simple and easy. Kate, who had started the conversation with her daughter in a disgusted and frightened mood, caught herself smiling after a few minutes. It was her husband who was smiling as he listened to Pam rant on the subject of her upcoming married life. Pam had an amazing ability, if not to solve problems on the fly, then to make them simple and quite insurmountable in the eyes of others and in her own eyes. Natural optimism and inexorable confidence in their abilities were her constant helpers in this. In general, Pam got married as easily and simply as she did everything in her life. A few years passed. Pam settled down. 
She graduated by correspondence from one of the institutes with a degree in economics and worked as a realtor, making a very good living, by the looks of it. With William her first youth, as his mother called his husband, she separated two years after the wedding. Just split up, that's all. It was better for him, and for me, shrugged her shoulders and summed up her married life. And for some reason it never occurred to anyone to accuse her of frivolity, of irresponsibility, and a bunch of other faults that any other person in the same exact situation would have been accused of. Well, really, what could be more natural for people to be worse together than apart? And so they, as Pam put it, split up. Really, it's as simple as that. Things worked out very differently for Anne. Anne enrolled in college right out of high school. Basically, she didn't understand how she could waste time looking and thinking about it. Despite all her efforts at school, the certificate, she pulled a little above average, with the thought that she should get an education. She applied to a place where she was sure of her abilities, a teacher training institute. After receiving a diploma as a teacher of Russian language and literature, Anne went to work in a school, but quickly realized that this is absolutely not her. She was not called to pedagogy and teaching at all. And after a couple of years, she quit her job and got a job as an office manager in a small firm. She lived a quiet, peaceful life in a small one-room apartment inherited from her grandmother. She had never had a relationship with a man since the day Pam had scared David away at a student party. No one had ever courted her. On weekends, she went to her parents' house and honored all the rituals. Obedient and respectful daughter participated in family dinners and tea parties. She worked in the garden plot, reporting to her mother about her health. The most difficult tests were meetings with the indomitable Uncle Nicholas, the husband of Mom's sister. He invariably embarrassed Anne with the rhetorical question, Anne, when are we going to celebrate your wedding? And he'd snidely add, I wish I lived to see it. Pam, of course, attended all the family events, but as usual at them with their mouths open. Everyone listened only to Pam, looked only at her. Pam was always learning something, going somewhere or just returning from somewhere. She easily introduced her family to potential husband candidates who disappeared as quickly as they appeared. She was still the family powder keg of fireworks, but the kind that warmed rather than burned everything around her. Anne, in general, was content with her life, so clear and right. And only occasionally, on one long, dreary, lonely evening, she said to herself frankly and honestly, I envy Pam. I envy her attitude toward life, toward herself and others. I envy her luck. I even envy her looks. I envy the fact that she has never been alone for a minute in her life, but has always chosen for herself who to be with. She wouldn't admit that to anyone else, not even her mom, not even under threat of death. Anne's life was measured, settled, boring, but familiar and understandable, changed in an instant. And she had her grandfather's old car, rusting in the garage for years, to thank for that. Anne had wanted to learn to drive for a long time. She remembered well her first childhood feeling, when she first saw a woman behind the wheel, she was 14 years old. Back then, in the mid-90s, a car was a luxury not available to everyone, and there were very few women driving cars. Anne opened her mouth and stared at the brunette who had just parked the car. The woman slammed the door, locked it, and disappeared behind the door of the department store. Anne continued to stare at her mesmerized. The car enthusiast seemed almost heavenly to Anne. How delightful it is to be so brave, independent, and beautiful. The woman, by the way, was not beautiful at all, but in Anne's eyes she was enveloped in such an automobile glow. And looks didn't matter at all. When I grow up, I will definitely drive a car. Anne decided once and for all, there are some people who are made to drive, and some who just aren't. The former and the latter learn all the wisdom of driving in the same way, spending the same amount of time and effort, after which the former get behind the wheel of the car and drive away quietly, and the latter continue to drown on the spot and do not understand anything. Anne was, unfortunately, one of the latter. 
She didn't have some necessary quality, some trait of ability necessary for driving a car. Anne was an intelligent girl. She had graduated, of course, not the most difficult, but not the easiest university. She'd always read a lot. She was smart and lively. But she changed beyond recognition when she got behind the wheel. Anne, as if catastrophically stupid, lost reaction coordination in space and confidence immediately after being behind the wheel of the car. How else could one explain her state, in which she completely forgot where right and left were? And what is the difference between a main road and a secondary road? What is there even elementary to correct the rearview mirror and not to throw the seatbelt? Came to her mind only after the instructor asked her ironic, leading questions. Did we forget anything? First time passing the theory exam, Anne entered a protracted torment streak with a practical driving test. Anne, why are you doing this? Why do you bother? Well, it's not your thing, her parents urged as they watched her suffer. No, I have to pass. I have to get my license. Finally, fate took pity on Anne, and by some miracle, she managed to get from the beginning to the end of her exam site without stalling once, without breaking the laws and even turning on the right signal when turning. Having received the coveted license, Anne, unlike many novice motorists, did not fall into euphoria. She understood perfectly well that now the real learning to drive begins. She timidly asked her dad for a few lessons, and received an optimistic of course, my daughter. However, after ten minutes Anne clearly realized that her father could not teach her to drive, like millions of other men who taught their wives, daughters and sisters to drive. Dad instantly changed from a kind and gentle, intelligent man who never raised his voice at her to a monster with a twisted face, spewing curses and complaints. It ended in a martyr's cry. What on earth are you doing? You're going to burn out the clutch. Anne then got out of the car and carefully closed the door behind her. It was clear that as a driving instructor Dad had failed, and Anne's inability, as he said, to do basic things was astounding. Still, Anne didn't give up, seeing her daughter's persistence and grim determination. The father suddenly said, You know, daughter, there is one option. We have in the garage or in my father's old jiggly. Grandfather, unfortunately, did not catch. But the car must remember. Come on, Anne, I'll go to the garage tomorrow. I'll see what's there. And as soon as I repair it, I'll start it. And if it works out, you can use it to learn. The next day, Dad really went to the garage and fixed up Grandpa's car. It was a very old 1,975-year-old car. That is, ten years older than Anne herself. It looked a little sad, of course, but it started up quite briskly and started early Sunday morning while the roads were empty. Anne drove off in an old rattling car that rattled and shuddered at every bump. She drove out of town to an old abandoned driving range that was occasionally still used by woeful drivers like herself, that the instructor at the driving school had told her about. All day long, Anne had studied hard to learn how to start, stop, turn, and move from one lane to another. She was very tired, hungry. The sandwiches and water she'd brought with her were long gone, and the battery on her cell phone was going red. Turning off the car, Anne got out of the car and ran her palm affectionately over the cooling hood. With a full body stretch, she sucked in the fresh evening air and looked up at the sun that was clearly setting. It was time to go home. All the more reason for Anne to be proud of herself. This day had given her a lot of confidence in her own abilities. Anne got into the car and turned the ignition key. Then again and again, the car responded with dead silence. At first Anne didn't even realize what had happened, and sitting behind the wheel, she turned the key again and again. Suddenly she began to realize what had happened. She was stuck in a very remote place, off the highway, and even off the country roads, where rare cars pass by, here at this old abandoned driving range. She could well be stuck here all night, horrified, calling herself the last words. She remembered that she hadn't even warned her friends where she was going, grabbing her cell phone in the hope that it would be enough for one life-saving call. 
She realized that the cell phone was dead. The thought of walking and looking for help Anne dismissed immediately. It seemed to her that she had forgotten which way the city was. The car suddenly seemed to her an island of some safety, something native, a place where she could at least lock herself away in case of trouble. In general, Anne was very close to a real, full-blown hysteria, and held on with all her might. God, what to do? Inwardly chilled with fear, thought Anne. What to do? That's the fool that huddled in a lump in the driver's seat and clutched her hands in the steering wheel. Anne could feel the evening twilight fast approaching. How long she had been in the car, Anne did not know. She didn't have a watch, except for her extinguished cell phone. Probably long enough, since her long legs clenched and shoved under the driver's seat had gotten quite tired. Suddenly already Anne had reached some kind of sound. She was afraid to believe it, but it was very much like the sound of an automobile engine. Anne looked up. In the thickening dusk in the distance jumped not even light, resembling the light of headlights. So those are headlights. It's a car. Anne jumped out of the car and almost fell to her knees. Her legs were so numb. Anne jumped on the spot and ran towards the light. The car was not far away, about 200 meters, and cautiously crept along a bad road, more like a path, going a little away from the autodrome. What do we do? Oh my God! What if this? What if I get raped or killed? Thoughts raced through my head. Fear was stronger. She ducked and ran back to her car, yorking into it and locking all the doors and lay low. But it was obviously too late. She'd been spotted. She realized it from the headlights, which were much brighter and clearly shining in her direction. A few minutes later the car entered the autodrome, in the middle of which, like a monument sticking out like a monument, was a vehicle with the driver curled up inside. She tried to squeeze herself as hard as she could and managed to practically cram herself under the steering wheel. From the sound of it, the car pulled up close and stopped. There was the sound of a door opening and footsteps. A few seconds later, there was a tap on the window of the car. She felt like her heart was going to burst right now. Twisting her neck, she glanced up. Behind the glass, a male silhouette could be seen in the dusk. The man waited a few more seconds and tapped on the glass again, with his knuckles. Hey. Anne heard a voice muffled by the door. Are you alive in there? Yes. Unexpectedly, Anne answered from under the steering wheel. What are you doing in there? The stranger asked a reasonable question. I'm learning to drive. For some reason, Anne joined the conversation without changing her posture. Anne had not heard such laughter for a long time. The man laughed so sincerely and contagiously that Anne herself involuntarily began to smile. Most importantly, she was relieved to realize that there was no danger. There was no way a man with such a sincere and cheerful laugh could do her any harm. She struggled to straighten up and finally got out of the car and looked at her unexpected companion. He continued to sob with laughter. The man was short and stout. His face was uncommonly ugly in the usual sense of the word. Every feature in particular, eyes, mouth, nose, ears, and everything else seemed to be quite normal. But altogether on the same face was assembled in a rare and ridiculous composition. His nose was a potato. His ears stuck out frankly on the sides of his bald head. However, if this man smiled, his lack of handsomeness was immediately forgotten, because it was a smile that was extremely charming and unusually adorned him. Anne looked at the owner of the unusual face, and he looked at her. Suddenly, as if awake, he finally turned his gaze to the car. So what happened? He looked merrily at the car, then at the owner. Yes, we've come to the end of the road, it seems. Anne answered cheerfully. For some reason, in the presence of this man, whose strange face she had met five minutes ago, under very strange circumstances, she suddenly felt light and calm. She was sure that everything would be all right now. What was the basis of this sudden confidence? She could never explain. It was just a feeling, that's all. Interesting machine. The man turned the ignition key and opened the hood of the old car, just in case. Well. Let's get acquainted, shall we? 
He mumbled, leaning over the hood and looking into the innards of the car. What's your name? My name's Anne. You know, it's a silly thing to do. I mean, she's old. I had to work out. And here I am. Suddenly, a man said point blank, looking at Anne. Who? What? That piece of junk. Anne was astonished. I meant you, actually. The man's head disappeared behind the hood again. She felt herself blushing with embarrassment. The compliment was pleasant, unusual, but very straightforward. But it needs repair, of course. Some leaks. The paint is peeling, you can hear it muttering. Embarrassment has been replaced by outrage. What do you think you're doing? Anne exclaimed. I'm talking about the car. He laughed uncontrollably. Anne sobbed and smiled. She didn't want to be angry with him. The man shut the hood and wiped his hands with an unknown rag. Well, Anne, I can't help you here. And it's dark already. Let's think about what to do. Anne shrugged her shoulders. What to do in this situation? She didn't know. It's impossible to make a phone call from here. There's no signal. I wouldn't risk leaving you here even for a couple of hours. You can't leave your car here overnight. That's for sure. Then we'll have to drag it into town on a cable. Let's try that. Five minutes later, everything was ready and they tried it. As soon as the car attached by cable to the Savior's car moved, Anne frantically gripped the steering wheel and pressed the brake as hard as she could. It suddenly seemed to her that her Zhigilonok was being carried at mad speed into the trunk. Of the car ahead of her, there was nothing she could do about it. Okay, I get it. So, option number two. You get in my car and tow your car. It's for the best. By the way, Anne, I could still be a maniac. The uncle tried to make a joke when he saw Anne literally cringe at his suggestion. To drive someone else's car. Even though, judging by the look of it, it was not the most expensive one. And to drag a huge piece of rusty iron behind her on a rope was comparable to going to the moon. No. She declared categorically and resolutely. No, I can't take that risk. I'm a very bad driver. I'll probably wreck your car. In fact, I'd rather stay here. You go ahead. I'll text you my dad's phone number. When you get a connection, please call me. She was mumbling. And she was terrified to imagine that he would leave now. And she would be left alone in the dark in an old abandoned wasteland surrounded by thickets. It was so frightening that she looked at the man pleadingly. Anne, maybe you should ask me my name, the man said suddenly. What a fool, Anne scolded herself. He's been jumping all over her for half an hour. She hadn't even bothered to ask his name. Oh, please forgive me. I'm a little dumb from all this. What's your name? Anne mentally thanked the darkness for not seeing her reddened ears. Well, at last, I thought I was going to be a nameless hero. My name is Thomas. Nice to meet you. Now we know each other well. So let's go home. Or rather, not home, but to the car service center where I actually work. Thomas sat down firmly behind the wheel of the old car and with a nod, showed Anne in the direction of his car. Anne, don't be afraid of anything. You'll be fine. I had a lot of faith in you, she heard in her back. Turning around, she looked into Thomas's eyes. He was smiling cheerfully, warmly, encouragingly. Anne suddenly had a terrible desire to justify his trust, to show Thomas that she was not a helpless fool in an old car, but a very independent and courageous lady. Anne took a deep breath and got into Thomas's car. It was late at night when they reached the city. They reached the city without any adventures. Anne pulled up gingerly at a small building with a sign for an automobile repair shop. She got out of Thomas's car and only now realized how tense she'd been the whole way, afraid of making a mistake and embarrassing herself in front of her new acquaintance. She stretched her tense shoulders with pleasure and inhaled a full lungful of fresh night air. Well done, Anne. She heard Thomas's voice. Never speak again and think you can't drive. Anne looked at her new acquaintance. He was smiling his unusual, kind, charming smile. And she stopped noticing again how ugly he was. She was suddenly reluctant to part with him. 
Well, Anne, this is where we'll leave your family heirloom. I'll start it up tomorrow and take it wherever you want it. Agreed? Thomas, still smiling, looked at her. He's going to be here tomorrow. I mean, I'll see him tomorrow. Anne thought happily. Yes, of course you will. But it's not very convenient, I suppose. Why would you waste your time repairing it, driving it to the other side of town? It's no trouble at all. And it will be a pleasure to see you again. Thomas suddenly said the very phrase Anne wanted to hear. Now I'll take you home, and I'll find out where you live, and you won't be able to get away from me. The next day, Thomas brought the old car. Anne met her hero, as she called him to herself, in full parade. This full parade had cost her a lot of work. She realized that she had grown fat, completely forgotten how to paint, ran her hair, and an attempt to walk in heels ended with her nearly dislocating her foot. She had to wear sneakers and very little makeup. But apparently Thomas was not a very attractive connoisseur of female beauty. At the sight of Anne, he sighed in admiration. You know, Anne, this is going to sound very trite, but you're so beautiful. I noticed it yesterday, but today you are just dazzling. I probably wouldn't even recognize you today. Anne listened to all these uncomplicated compliments. She felt very easy and good with this man, who happened to meet everyone in her path. She didn't care that he wasn't handsome, that he had such unkept hands with machine oil and dust forever embedded in his skin, that he was simply and obviously cheaply dressed. Anne suddenly realized that her gratitude to this man for rescuing her in the dark wasteland, for trusting him on the way back for looking admiringly at her as Miss Universe, catastrophically quickly escalating into something more. Thomas, why don't you come and visit me? Anne uttered the phrase and only then realized what she had said. For the first time in her life, she'd given in to her emotions and done what she wanted to do, not what was right. Just like Pam. Suddenly it flashed through her mind. My pleasure, Thomas said simply. Thanks for not going to a restaurant. I don't feel right in restaurants. Anne smiled at the unintentional pun, and hardly able to contain her excitement, made an appointment with him for the following weekend evening. She didn't even want to remember the fuss she'd made the night before Thomas came to her apartment. She didn't know how to host a man. She spent the whole night thinking about what to cook, what alcohol to buy, how to dress and calm her hair. Should she put on makeup? In general, high morning she had exhausted herself so much that she was ready to call Thomas and cancel everything. And then an unexpected thought popped into her head. Pam was the one who could help her in this situation. It was difficult and unusual for Anne to turn to her sister, especially for such an occasion. But she couldn't see any other way out. Pam, hi, she said, hearing her sister's cheerful voice. Pam, I need your help. What? Pam looked surprised. Did I miss here? Ms. Order is asking Aunt House for help. What in the world has happened? Pam, would you please stop playing around? Are you gonna help or not? Anne was suddenly angry. That's it. That's it. That's it. I'm sorry. Her sister laughed merrily. You just took me by surprise. Well, tell me. You know, I mean, how can I explain it? Well, it's short. Anne finally made up her mind and blurted it out. I met a man. I really liked him. And I think he liked me too. I invited him over, and now I don't know what to do. There was a silence on the phone. Pam, are you there? Anne asked after waiting about ten seconds. Yeah, I'm just here digesting the information. Oh, come on. You should have warned me. Bringing a man into your apartment at thirty, and not even telling anyone. You're quite the slut, aren't you? Pam, I'm gonna hang up now. Anne was already kicking herself for her impulse to call Pam. I mean, she knew it wouldn't do any good. It's all true. It's all true. I'm sorry. But I couldn't pass up the chance. Pam laughed contagiously. And Anne, as always, smiled back. So what's the problem? What can I do to help? I don't know what to do. I'm sitting here like an idiot, and I don't know what to cook what to buy, what to wear. Oh, I see. Pam's changed to a business-like tone. 
What time is your rendezvous scheduled? Five o'clock. You guys have a matinee or something. Pam couldn't help but laugh again. It's fine. We'll be fine. Why don't you go to the bathroom and get cleaned up? No Babylons on your head. Just a few light curls and don't paint your face. Like you did last time at your mom's birthday party. You have a lovely black dress with lace sleeves. Go get it. Anyway, you just do your thing. I'll be there in an hour and a half. Pam was out. And Anne felt like a weight had been lifted off her shoulders. For some reason, she immediately believed that everything was going to be okay. Pam, as usual, didn't come in, but whirled into the apartment, which seemed even brighter. Dumping a pile of bags in the kitchen, Pam stared critically at her sister. Wipe that lipstick off, Pam declared emphatically. I'll tell you when you're a woman, Vamp, but definitely not today. So turn your back. It's pretty good. Just don't slouch or wave your arms like a windmill. Watch this. Pam started ripping through bags of wine. I don't know who your date is. I mean, normal men bring their own wine. Well, just to be on the safe side. Here's some rolls, salad, olives, fruit. I think you'll have enough for the first time. I defrosted the meat. Anne said confused. Pam turned sharply to her sister. So, are you going to fry cutlets and cook portion now? Oh, Anne, you're just like a little child. You'll have time to scare him with your culinary masterpieces. That is, if he comes back after tonight. Pam continued to enjoy herself. In half an hour, they had set the perfect table. Frankly, Anne herself, of course, would never have done that. Pam, isn't this a little over the top? Eh? You know, the hors d'oeuvres, the wine, even the candles. And he won't think I'm hanging around his neck or anything. Pam rolled her eyes in martyrdom. You know, I really hope he does. Especially about all that stuff. Don't be so shaky, Pam said lastly. It's just a man who's just coming to visit. Listen, I've been thinking, and I think I'm gonna stay. Why don't I sit with you guys and keep an eye on you? I'll see what kind of a miracle it is that can get over the castle wall. Pam grabbed an olive from a vase on the table and settled comfortably in the chair. Anne looked at her sister apprehensively. She hadn't heard such laughter in a long time. Not even from Pam. Anne, you really are a five-canter. Pam let out a breath. Okay, all right. Don't be afraid of anything. Good luck. I'm out of here. She headed for the exit. Pam, Anne followed her sister into the hallway. Thank you. I don't know what I would have done without you. Oh, it was worth putting up with you for 26 years to hear that. Pam walked over to Anne, adjusted the rose pendant around her neck, and suddenly kissed her on the cheek. Everything was beautiful. Thomas arrived with a bouquet of gorgeous roses and a bottle of red wine, immediately falling into the classification of normal men. The appetizers bought by an experienced hand complemented their meeting, not interfered with it, as often happens at a messy, lavish table. They talked easily and simply on a variety of topics, and after an hour they were already happily on a first-name basis. Anne felt beautiful and elegant and constantly caught the admiring gaze of her guest. What a beautiful pendant! Thomas suddenly said, It's very elegant. Yes, it's unusual. It was custom-made. A gift from my grandmother. There are only two of them. I have one and my sister has the other. Anne enjoyed talking about her family's jewelry, knowing that it was a story that people loved. You have a sister. Thomas looked surprised. Is she as beautiful and smart as you are? Well, how can I tell you? Anne laughed. Actually, to be honest, of the two of us, Pam was always considered by everyone to be much prettier and smarter. Really, Thomas seemed genuinely, genuinely surprised. But that's impossible. What do you think? I don't know. Anne shrugged her shoulders. She didn't want to talk about it. To be honest, she was different. It's just that we're very different, even though we're alike. As everyone says, I'm sure there's no one better than you. Even your miracle sister can't compete with you. Although, of course, I'd be interested in meeting her. 
I don't know where you'd meet our Pam. Unless she brings her car to your service station for repairs. She's in a whole different world. She's got crazy interests. I don't think she knows what she wants sometimes. Well, you're intrigued. I'll definitely meet her. I mean, there's no other way. I mean, we're gonna be a family. Unless, of course, you marry me. At that moment, Anne was standing with her back to Thomas, pouring tea. Anne slowly turned to Thomas and looked into his eyes. His funny, ugly face suddenly seemed the most beautiful face she had ever seen. Anne, I love you. I loved you as soon as I saw you in the vacant lot behind the car window. Will you be my wife? Standing before her was a man she had known for less than a week. She knew nothing about him except his name and his profession. She understood that she had to calm down, analyze the situation, and understand the absurdity and impropriety of what was happening now. But she wasn't going to calm down. She wasn't going to analyze. She suddenly didn't care at all what she had to do. Perhaps for the first time in her life, she was absolutely sure of what she wanted. Yes, I will be your wife without a second's hesitation, Anne replied. Thomas was well received by his parents and grandmother. Probably, if only because, he was the first and only man who looked at their wayward child with such a warm feeling. For that, he was instantly forgiven his dirty hands. The ill-fitting suit and the lack of a high school diploma. Thomas was soon introduced to the rest of the few remaining relatives and family friends. Uncle Nicholas, who had been worried about Anne's fate for so long, was especially amazed. Oh my God, I've waited after all. He stretched out and wiped away the tears with his sleeve. After that, Uncle Nicholas was so exultant about Anne's fate that my mother said she would not allow him to come to the wedding. There will be a wedding, won't there? Mom turned to Thomas and Anne. There will be, Thomas said firmly. I want everyone to see the most beautiful bride in the world. Pam met Thomas much later, as she was on another trip. When she returned home, she was amazed to hear how far Anne had come in her relationship with her new acquaintance. Well, Anne, you're on the fast track to a five-year plan in a week. Pam shook her head incredulously. Listen, and this is the same one, for which you so rushed around the apartment. The one you were gonna feed meatballs to on the first date. Is that him, or is it someone else? Pam, Anne resisted the urge to respond harshly to her sister's teasing. You helped me a lot back then, and I'll always be grateful. Please help me again, or rather, don't spoil a day. This man is very dear to me. I love him very much and I want to be with him for the rest of my life. After ten days of knowing him, you're so full of shit, and I was the one who was always getting nagged by everyone for rushing things. Pam shrugged and smiled. Okay, don't get cocky. I promise I'll be the model sister who looks into the mouth of the smart, beautiful, and kind big sister. Despite Pam's promises, Anne anxiously awaited the day Pam and Thomas met. Thomas arrived early. It seemed that nothing and no one could spoil his mood. Pam flew into the apartment, as was her custom, as soon as she saw the door. She'd recently grown her hair long and now it hung spectacularly behind her. With a twinkle in her eye, she lowered herself gracefully into the chair and put her foot on her leg in a luxuriously smooth gesture. So where is my new relative? Pam grinned languidly, looking at Thomas absent-mindedly. Anne sighed and looked up doomedly. She knew exactly what was about to happen. Thomas would look at Pam dazedly and mesmerized and blush. Then an involuntary admiration would appear in his gaze. His movements would become awkward and stiff and his speech confused. It was always like that with all the men in Anne's memory when they saw her little sister for the first time. And hello to you, young lady. Are you the sister of my beloved Anne? Suddenly sounded in reply. Anne looked at Thomas. There was not a trace of mesmerized admiration or excitement on his face. He was looking at Pam with curiosity and clearly not intending to swoon at her incredible charm. Pam was a little confused. After all, she was used to men's completely different reactions to her, especially when she wanted them. She put her foot down and straightened up in the chair, with her palms folded in her lap without a fatal smile on her face. 
Pam instantly became just a pretty young woman, almost a girl. Excuse me, Pam suddenly squeaked. I'm Anne's sister, Pam. Pam. And I'm Anne Thomas's fiancé. Nice to meet you, replied Thomas. That was the end of the formal part of the evening. They sat around the table, ate cake, drank tea and talked. Or rather, it was mostly Anne and Thomas who talked. Pam was unaccustomed to being quiet and somewhat inconspicuous. Surprisingly enough, it was for her. She sat at the table and listened with occasional words and phrases. Finally, about to leave, Pam rose from the table. Thank you for a wonderful evening. It was a pleasure to meet you. Pam extended her hand to Thomas, kissed Anne on the cheek, and said nothing more. Pam left the apartment. The next day, Anne couldn't resist calling her sister to see if Thomas liked her. Why should I like him? He's your man. You should like him. I mean, honestly. He's a nice guy. He's kind of ugly. But you don't have to take him to beauty contests. I'm sure our genes will win out in a nephew. Pam, as usual, turned the conversation into a joke. A year before Thomas and Anne met, Thomas had an uncle who had lived far from the city all his life. The old man was a lonely, childless man who had buried his wife long ago. Thomas visited him often when he was a boy. And then, when he became an adult, he often visited his uncle. So it was no surprise that it was Thomas he bequeathed a house and a small plot of land seventy kilometers from the city. The village was old and abandoned. Along the only street stretched crumbling fences, from behind which you could see shabby houses with broken glass and wood-burning roofs. Nature was taking back everything that people had taken from it with great speed. The abandoned yards were already covered with a thick, almost impassable thicket of bushes, nettles, wormwood and hemp as tall as a man grew as a single green mass along the fences. Only a few houses were repaired with modern materials, standing under metal roofs and with plastic windows. In winter, the village was covered with such drifts that the few residents had to rely solely on the local resident Alex, the owner of the tractor. Alexa in the morning, having got a hangover with moonshine of his own making, cleared the village street to the district road, and everyone sighed with relief. In spring and fall the same Alex, of course. For a fee, pulled out of the impenetrable mud jeeps of all brands and colors, cheerfully quoting the saying the cooler the jeep, the farther to run after the tractor. In Alex's case, the saying was truly golden. And if we take into account the number of hunters and fishermen coming from all over the region to the surrounding lakes, marshes, forests, and fields, and there was really a lot to come for. The area, located in the floodplain of the mighty Siberian River, was all covered with streams of lakes and ponds teeming with fish. There was a variety of game in the forests. In winter, wolves and moose came to the people living in sparsely scattered small villages. There were so many hares that sometimes they managed to raid the vegetable garden much earlier than the owners. The pine boar, for as long as little Anne could remember, she had always wanted a dog, not a toy dog, no toy dogs of all sizes and colors that her relatives bought her endlessly. She wanted a real live dog. She dreamed of how the little shaggy lump would become her most loyal friend, how she would walk and play with him, take care of him. But that dream never came true. Mom, Dad and Anne lived for a long time in a tiny one-room apartment where a dog was out of the question because of the cramped space. Finally, when Anne was four, her parents got a bigger apartment with two rooms and a large hallway. Anne was the most excited of all. At last her dream would come true. She would have a dog that would live with her in one of the rooms of their apartment. Anne, sunshine, let's wait with the dog, honey, mom said. You see, we're going to have another baby soon. The girl is your little sister. Anne listened and realized bitterly that she wasn't going to have a dog. At least not in the near future. Six months later, Pam, Anne's little sister, came into their family. A few days after Mom came home from the hospital with Pam, they had a small party at their house. Grandma, an aunt, Mum's sister and her husband, and a couple of very close friends of Dad's came over. After the adults had sat and drank to the health of the little girl and her mother, 
Uncle Nicholas asked the frowning Anne in the nasty, husky voice that some adults find it necessary to speak to children. Anne, are you very glad you have a little sister now? No, Anne said clearly and loudly. Not at all. There was silence in the room. The adults were clearly confused and didn't know what to say. Why? Uncle Nicholas asked rashly. Because I wanted a dog, not a sister. Four-year-old Anne answered honestly and frankly. The adults moved and coughed in embarrassment. Some tried to laugh to turn it into a joke. Anne didn't ruin the party, but she didn't make it any better. After the guests left, her mother criticized Anne for her words and shamed her for her bad attitude toward her little sister, and Anne sincerely could not understand what she was guilty of. She had told the truth. She didn't need her little sister, but she did need a dog. Pam grew up happy, healthy, and boisterous. Her parents adored her, and Anne often thought they didn't really need her now. But childish resentment was commonplace jealousy. In such a situation, Anne made her secret. Pam needed an eye on her. And as Anne grew older, she began to help her mother with Pam. She learned to dress and feed her sister. She walked and played with her. She sat with Pam when Mommy had to go out for a little while. All in all, everything seemed to be going well. But Mom noticed with some concern that Anne had not developed any special love for her little sister. It was as if Anne was fulfilling a responsible family duty. The girl's mom, Kate, shared her concerns with her husband. Oh, come on, Kate. Don't get all worked up and everything is normal. They're just still little, both of them. And Anne is too little to understand what a baby sister is. You think so? Did Kate look at her husband with doubt? Of course, she's not interested in Pam yet. Well, what's so interesting? She's lying down. So she's screaming. So she's walking. It's a big deal. So not a person yet, but a billet. Her husband laughed, looking tenderly at Kate. And Anne is a serious lady. Now Pam will talk. Anne will change it once. You'll see. Oh, Jack, I wish it could come true the way you say. Let's do it in a year. When Pam's older, we'll get Anne a dog. Ha. Huh. We'll see. I don't think Anne's gonna have time for a dog anytime soon. Kate's husband ended the conversation. The girls grew, changed, and in general, not much different from millions of other sisters. They quarreled, made up, quarreled again, and again made up, argued, played. And everything seemed to be normal. The first signal that things between the sisters were not as easy as they seemed came when Anne was ten and Pam was six. Anne was walking Pam home from kindergarten. The way home passed through the schoolyard and the stadium, where Anne saw a group of classmates. The girls talked as if they hadn't been apart since three hours ago. It was about twenty minutes later when Anne saw Pam missing, running around the stadium looking for her obnoxious little sister. Anne suddenly heard a quiet, Anne, I'm here. Pam's voice came from downstairs. Anne looked around in fright and realized the sound was coming from the hole that was supposed to signify a foxhole in civil defense class. Pam was sitting in the corner of the trench. What are you sitting there for? Come out quickly. Anne waved her hand impatiently. I can't for some reason, said Pam, and squirmed. Anne struggled to get Pam out of the trench and dragged her home by the hand. As she walked, she wondered who was going to get the worst of it from Mommy tonight. For the dirty jacket, her sister or her, when she got home, and felt entitled to be angry with Pam. Anne said to her, Now sit in your room and wait for your parents. You'll have to explain yourself to them. Pam sobbed strangely. She was unusually quiet and silent. However, Anne, who had just arranged a meeting with her friends, was not up to her whims. After half an hour, Anne ran out into the street and did not return until evening. Such faces on her parents' faces Anne had never seen before. Silently letting Anne into the apartment, her mother went into the kitchen without saying a word. Anne, frightened by her mother's behavior, quickly undressed and followed her. The parents were sitting at the table with Pam, sitting between them with her arm in a cast. It turned out that when the little girl had fallen down the hole, she had broken her arm. Anne looked at Pam in horror. 
For the first few minutes, she didn't know what to say. And there was a heavy silence in the kitchen, which was finally broken by her mother. Why don't you tell me how it happened? Mom's voice sounded calm, but it felt like she was holding on with all her might. Mom, she just fell, that's all. I didn't know. She didn't tell me anything. How could I have known? Anne babbled. Why didn't she say anything to me? Pam, why? Why didn't you tell me you were hurt? Anne was almost screaming. Why didn't you? Exactly. Why all of a sudden did Daddy say that? Here you go and think why. Anne lay face down on her bed and cried, feeling deeply hurt and offended. Why was she blamed for everything? Was she the one who had pushed Pam into the pit? And was it her fault that Chatterbox Pam had somehow not said anything to her this very time? And would she have made Pam suffer in pain until her parents came? If she knew she was in trouble. So why was everyone jumping on her? The door to the room she and Pam shared shrieked open. Pam stood on the threshold, her face tear-stained with sunken eyes. Anne, I'm sorry I didn't say anything to you. I'll never do it again. I'll be sure to tell you right away when I fall again. There won't be a next time. Don't fall again. Anne said all this into the pillow and generally come here. They sat together on the bed for a long time, pressed tightly against each other perhaps for the first time in their lives. And Mom was in the kitchen quietly crying into Dad's shoulder. It was a terrible incident that, strangely enough, brought the sisters closer together. Anne was more sensitive. And Pam was smarter than their parents thought. The older sister became more attentive to the baby, and the younger sister reached out to Anne in a childlike way, sensing that attention. For several years after that, they had an almost perfect duo complimenting each other. Anne taught Pam to take things seriously, helped her do her homework, and Pam amused Anne. Was her home theater and circus, as Daddy used to say, except that Anne never got the dog she wanted because of Pam's severe allergy to hair. Her grandmother, who lived in another town and saw her family not as often as everyone would have liked. On one visit, she called the girls over to her, with a mysterious smile, she pulled a small velvet box out of her pocket. Fourteen-year-old Sirius beyond her years, Anne and Pam, who had turned ten the day before. They came over and sat down next to Grandma. Girls, my darlings, I have a present for you. You have become real sisters. You should always remember that relatives are not just those who were born in the same family. Siblings are when one hurts and the other feels the pain. Be together and love each other. And to always remember that each of you has a sister. I give you this. Grandma opened a red box. Two perfectly identical gold pendants were fixed on white silk. On the thin ovals lay dainty, very thin roses, and along the edge of the pendants ran a scarcely perceptible garland of color. How lovely! Pam squealed enthusiastically. Anne smiled demurely and gratefully. Wear it! my darlings, and remember that there is no one in the world closer and more dear to you. There are only two such pendants on earth, one for each of you. Cherish them, but most importantly, cherish your feelings for each other. Grandma's gift kept the girls' imaginations busy for a long time. At least Pam did. She wore the pendant without taking it off. She showed it off to everyone, and was sure to tell them what it was for. Then, invariably, Anne would be asked to show her pendant and asked to compare the two pieces of jewelry. The girls were very different and at the same time remarkably alike. They were really very much alike in appearance, so much so that from a distance they were often mistaken for twins, especially after Pam had quickly caught up with her sister in height. But up close, the difference between them was obvious. Anne was certainly a very pretty girl, but her features were as if muted a little erased, covered with an invisible veil. Pam, on the other hand, unlike Anne, was all bright catchy memorable. Anne's light brown eyes were just brown to everyone, and Pam's eyes, which were exactly the same color as her sister's, seemed to glow a dark January. Her older sister's hair lay thick on her shoulders, but some dull strands in the younger one seemed lush and lively. 
Even the Kanapushki, protruding on their noses in the spring on the first sunshine, behaved differently. Hands were as if they were clumped together and seemed just a dark spot on the girl's face. Pam had them spreading cheerfully across her face, making it look unusually cute. It was as if Pam were sharing her joy with herself, with the whole world. Whereas Anne, on the contrary, hid everything, hid it from people. Pam was impulsively determined and impatient in everything she did without a second thought. She took up new endeavors and hobbies, and also without too much thought, and without regret, abandoned them. As soon as things cooled down, during her time at school, she managed to play in the humor team and the rock band of the school, painting, ballroom dancing, volleyball, and God knows what else. Anne, on the other hand, was not childishly persistent and stubborn in pursuing her goals. At the age of eight, she went to music school, and after a couple of years she realized that she was not interested in playing the piano, but no one ever found out about it. Year after year, Anne went to the hated piano and graduated from music school, naturally without much brilliance. Anne's playing wasn't particularly talented, but she was diligent. After that, almost no one but her mother heard her. Pam, meanwhile, in a few months learned to play the guitar quite dashingly and without learning the wisdom of solfeggio, invariably became the star of any party. At school, Anne clung to every grade as hard as she could, trying to be the best in every subject, and she was devastated when she failed. Pam moved from class to class with brilliant results in the subjects she was interested in and no worries about the subjects she, she said she didn't care about. That's how different they were. Of course, the years had made them smarter. The realization came that they were two of the closest people on earth to each other. They learned to respect each other, to recognize their mistakes and other people's truth. In general, to live as real sisters should. But whether in their relationship was a real sincere love for each other, did not know even their kind, wise, wonderful mother. Of course, Pam, such as she was, could not fail to be a success with the male population. The rare attention given by the boys, to the quite pretty Anne, was no comparison with Pam's popularity. The first very sensitive, though involuntary click from her sister, Anne received in the third year of the Institute. The guys in her group were merrily celebrating the midpoint of the student median. Much to Anne's surprise, her parents allowed her to host this somewhat risque event at their apartment. It was all very cool, especially the fact that David the guy in their group, who Anne really liked, was almost never leaving her side and had already said tons of compliments to her. By eleven o'clock in the evening the guys had gotten a little tipsy and daring at the same time. Anne suddenly felt David's arm around her waist with trepidation. Apparently, David was not going to limit himself to that. Anne waited with an agonizing yet joyful anxiety to see what would happen next and what she should do. There was nothing to do. The front door slammed and Pam burst into the room, shaking the snow from her hair. Not at all embarrassed by the fact that the apartment was packed with strangers older than she was, she got to know everyone in a few minutes, woke up the dozing, made the sad ones laugh, and she brought them along with her. A sense of excitement, freshness, and fun. The student party, which had almost faded thanks to Pam's 10th grade class, was boiling over with renewed vigor. But Anne didn't notice all that. Only one thing was important to her. David was no longer hugging her around the waist or looking at her at all but was staring at Pam in amazement. At that, Anne bitterly and honestly admitted to herself that Pam hadn't done anything on purpose. She had nothing to reproach her sister for, except that in Pam's presence Anne herself seemed to dissolve, to become invisible and uninteresting. The next day, Anne sobbed in her mother's lap, and a frightened Pam stood by her side. Mommy, I hate her. Anne screamed through her tears. She ruined my whole life. She stole David away from me. I don't want a sister like that. Quickly unbuttoning her shirt collar, Anne hooked a thin chain with her fingers and snatched her grandmother's pendant from her neck. Tossing it at Pam's feet, 
Anne became truly hysterical, completely stunned at such accusations, and especially that her sister had done such a thing. To their sister's pendant, Pam stoically met her mom's gaze. Mom, I have no idea what this is about. I don't know any David. Pam was near tears herself. Of course, when everyone had calmed down and sorted out the situation, Anne regretted her words and action. An apology was made. The chain was fixed, but there was still a lingering grudge on Anne's heart. When Anne graduated, 19-year-old Pam was still wondering what she should do. But to her credit, she didn't sit on her parents' neck. She had no complexes about it, typical for a girl from an intelligent family. She worked as a cashier in a fast-food restaurant. For some reason, she learned to sing to the amazement of her parents and had fun with her numerous friends. Mom occasionally shook her head, but there was nothing to reproach Pan with. The youngest daughter simply lived in the world for her own pleasure. And in some ways, Kate even secretly invited her. Six months later, however, Pam's easygoing attitude to life had gone a little too far. Mom, Dad, I'm getting married, Pam said simply and mundanely, sitting at the family dinner table, shoveling a piece of pie with gusto. Kate slowly and carefully put her fork on the table and for some reason looked not at the source of the sensational statement, but at her husband, to whom, calmly and ironically asked the father of the family, to the boy, Pan was clearly having a good time. And thank you for that. The father joined in the fun. Are you crazy? Kate's nerves finally gave out. Is this some kind of joke to you? You think this is funny? Mom, he's a great guy. We've known each other for six months. And we love each other. Pam stumbled on that last part. Pam, are you pregnant? Kate voiced her parents' biggest fear in Kate's eyes. It was the only reasonable explanation for a 19-year-old girl suddenly getting married. No, come on, Mom. That's ridiculous. Why would she be pregnant? We just want to be together. Don't worry, we won't bother you. William got the apartment from his grandmother. He's a rich heir. That's where we'll live. He works too, so we'll have money to live on. Anyway, my dear parents, everything is simple and good. Pam said serious phrases, questions she answered without waiting to be asked. They were very complicated, but somehow in Pam's mouth they quickly lost their complexity and gravity, and everything really began to seem simple and easy. Kate, who had started the conversation with her daughter in a disgusted and frightened mood, caught herself smiling after a few minutes. It was her husband who was smiling as he listened to Pam rant on the subject of her upcoming married life. Pam had an amazing ability if not to solve problems on the fly, then to make them simple and quite insurmountable in the eyes of others and in her own eyes. Natural optimism and inexorable confidence in their abilities were her constant helpers in this. In general, Pam got married as easily and simply as she did everything in her life. A few years passed. Pam settled down. She graduated by correspondence from one of the institutes with a degree in economics and worked as a realtor making a very good living, by the looks of it. With William her first youth, as his mother called his husband, she separated two years after the wedding. Just split up, that's all. It was better for him 